Hello amateurs, welcome to another episode of the Amateur Rugby Podcast, here to help soothe your Sunday morning hangover with some wonderful rugby chat about the grassroots of the game. I'm your host Tim and I've got another amazing guest for you today. This man is the founder of RugbyReferee.net, is the laws coordinator for World Rugby and most importantly, he used to referee me on a regular basis during my time at Old Colfians. Please welcome Mr. Keith Lewis. Keith, how are you? Hello, mate. How are you? Oh, great to be with you. Good to good to see you, mate, and welcome to the show. Now then, let's just uh, rewind the clock a little bit and talk, go back to those days when we shared a pitch. It was the early 2000s, I think. What are your sort of memories of those sort of games down at Horn Park? I loved it, totally loved it. So I was relatively new to um, South East London at that point, having moved around various different points in uni and all that kind of stuff. Um, so to land in Eltham and Old Colts down the road and lots of other little clubs, plenty, plenty of rugby around there um, as I was sort of coming up through the rugby levels and we kind of met each other on the same trajectory. Um, and I actually, I, go, I was going back through my files. So I thought I'd share share this with you. I found my my spreadsheet from the 0203 season. Yeah. Wow. Um, so the 19th of October, 2002, um, I always make a note of who the captains are in case I need to go back. So Tim won, that would be you. Um, and that was an important day in my world because that was my first ever national panel game as I was at the wow. sort of sub uh, at the top of the London setup, if you like, South East London. And that was my first level four game. So the first time I had a, uh, t- assistant, touch judges, assistant referees, um, first time with an RFU assessor effectively trying to breach over that barrier into the, the national panel um, and you'll be delighted to know that you won um, it was 27 21 against Westcombe Park the old foe so a perfect game for, for to drop a new kid into um, and the, the, the thing I found is that the game happened around me I didn't really contribute a great deal to it, it seemed to be the, the judgment of the assessor uh, it was Keith's first level game for first level four game and it showed his expectations were too high and he appeared to be almost in awe of them um, and you must have had a busy day because on the on the back that we, we always the assessment reports that we get you get three three things to de- de- develop and three strengths. The first one I had to develop was scrums, so we were obviously very familiar with each other that day because there were forty three of them according to this, but what? we only <laughs> we only had six resets, which I think is a credit to both you you on you as you on your side and and me on mine. So um, yeah, twenty forty three scrums, six resets, but yeah. Yeah, that, wow, that, that, that has that for a memory. That is amazing, Keith. Yeah. What a what a lovely little dip into memory lane there. I did not expect. Yeah, such that was great the, that was the first of first of many. I think our exchanges we kind of bounced around at those sort of levels, and it, it was great. And I still I still keep an eye out for the old Colts Blazers as I'm in and around stuff because they're quite distinctive. Yeah, they really are. Now I, I remember you from back then very clearly because I remember you as being a very sort of friendly and approachable referee, and not all are. So was that a deliberate sort of standpoint that you took, or is it just your natural yeah, personality? Look, it, it is my it is my natural personality. I mean, if anyone if anyone's been, I just look my my outside of rugby life has always been in comms, sort of a, as, a, as a communicator, whether that's in internal comms, media, social media, that kind of stuff. And I'm a real people person. Um, if you can see just over my thing there, if anyone's done insights, um, the yellow, green, red, blue thing that people come up with, I am a classic people person. So people pleaser to some extent. And I kind of just took that onto, onto the field. So I'm, we're there as referees to help the game. Um, that I see no benefit in turning up and, and being the opposite of all that and being very dictatorial, just getting on with the, the stuff because we're there to help um, rugby happen. And that's a key part of being a, a match official involved. And I, that was always my baseline. Um, so just getting on with it, working with the people that we've got to work with at any given point. So you, you as the captain, you as a front row, um, you as all those, and everyone around the, around the club to, to get an afternoon out. And um, loads of episodes and pre- loads of your previous guests have talked about um, being out there for fun. And that's part of what we do. We kind of, as we move up the food chain, that fun becomes a lesser part of it. It becomes competitive and everything that goes with it. Uh, but yeah, very, very much my my mindset of, of, of helping the game to happen and, and, and enjoying it myself as well. Yeah, well, from my point of view, it's very much appreciated. And when I look at the top level referees now, I always really enjoy watching the ones that have that same kind of personality. They seem relaxed on the pitch and, and are there to do that. But how do you get started in referee, Ray and Keith? How, what was your sort of first steps into it? 
Yeah, a bit of a cl classic route as a, as a youngster getting into it. I got injured at school, um, then moved school. So I did my back in. I was a hooker, weirdly a hooker. Um, don't really remember anything of that of those days coming through the school system. But I was never going to be a very good player. I'm like, I, I was. I'm not a loss to the playing fraternity of any description at all. Uh, kind of. So did my back in. Moved to school. Was doing A levels. The, the teaching staff at the school wanted some help doing the inter house competition. Some of the older sick formers to help out. So I volunteered. But this is this is not bad. Um, having moved from hooker to scrum half to extra resource, just bod on the side at uh, sixth form. I was never going to do anything particularly. So I thought, oh, let's have a little look at this refereeing malarkey. I was in Wales at the time. So I did the um, WIU referee course over a weekend at Sophia Gardens, which was which was brilliant. Um, and then moved to university up in Preston. Um, and really, that's where it all kicked on from there. It was, it was great to be in, in and around Preston Grasshoppers, in and around the university setup. Loads of rugby at different levels. Um, I was with Manchester and District Referee Society. Train lines really good around there, so they looked after me in terms of getting to to, to clubs um, on a train line or on a bus line, or they'd figure somebody out to pick me up and um, or do a double, and somebody would put me up overnight and do a Saturday and a Sunday, whatever it was. So loads of rugby, loads of experience, and it kind of just went went from there, and I kind of worked your way up through the system. Yeah, I didn't know you were up at Preston. That's a famous old club, made most famous by Wade Dooley, I, I presume. Wade Dooley, what's yeah. A, yeah, what's the club like, like when, when you were there? Was it still like a really sort of impressive club? Oh, yeah, really, really much so. I mean, they're one of the clubs now that they've replaced the uh, the, the old first team pitch with a, a 4G um, all-surface uh, pitch, which is great for a club environment. But it's a bit outside the town, so they've got lots of space, lots of ground. Um, easy to get to on the sort of junction of the the M6 and the M whatever it is that goes across to Blackpool. I don't know um, But yeah, it was a great club, and there's just loads of rugby. Um, the university used it at that time. They've they've since built their own sort of sports campus just down the road from there. So probably a little bit less now. Um, but but clubs like that are the, the lifeblood, and and I I I still really remember those guys that I kind of attached myself to. As I was coming through those those under, and I was I was eighteen at the time, so it sounds doesn't sound quite as bad. Um, under under, I was eighteen, so I was the kind of cottoned on to the or got into a group of sort of under thirteens, under fourteens, and the coaches there realised what I was trying to do, and they worked with me as much as they worked with their players. Um, so I, I would still tell you about Dave Kidd as a, as a coach up there who was had had I had no he had no skin in refereeing at all, but he was he was absolutely brilliant as someone who'd help help me in my refereeing in those early days. Um, and so again, that's I guess an appeal to to anyone on, who's listening. If you can see a referee in your club, look after them and support them and offer them in a, a council. There's some brilliant expertise within all our rugby clubs. Um, it'd be great if some of that um, could be rooted towards the, the referee group as well, because we're obviously we're, we're there. We want to help. We want to we want to do better rugby. And we want to get better at what we do. Um, and I still hark back to, to Dave and and those Roger Bowden was a great referee at ambassador's part of that club as well. Our FU assessor at the time. Um, there's some really great people there. So I, the fact that I can still talk about that, and it was 19, 1996 when I went there and still put those names out fresh shows the impact that those those two two gents certainly had on my refereeing back then. Yeah, yeah, that's really cool. Now, you said in passing there that they could see what you were trying to do. What was that? What, what kind of ambition were you showing at that time? Um, I, I'm not one of those who was actually that ambitious on the face of it. Um, we had... Okay, it was a few years later when, when I kind of moved down to, to London, your part of the world, where we started things started to get serious, and you could tell people who were on, who were who were there to go places, um, and I kind of never really had that uber ambitious streak, um, and that for me was was perfect because I didn't need to get involved in the competitive side of stuff. I just kind of get on with what I was doing, gradually learn, um, and that was just me. That worked perfectly for me. Um, so where, whereas from 96, seven through my trajectory went a bit like sort of slow diagonal stuff. I ended up in the right place, but it took me about 10 years longer than everyone else to get there. But by which time I got all the experience of moving around the country, the different styles of rugby that we have in England, being in different societies and moving around just geographically. Um, and that all added to my portfolio and, and kind of helped me to grow just as much as, as being the, 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 the sort of rapid riser. Um, there's not there is a there is a place for rapid rise. Um, I the, the the downside for me is that by the time I hit the the, the top level that I got to, which was um, championship level on field, um, I was too old to go any higher. The only place, the only way I could have made the leap into Premiership land um, was to have all the time and the effort and the the investment and the resource to 
particularly in physical training and that sort of training element side of things was to get a contract. And I was never going to get a contract um, because I was 28, 29 at that level. And at the same time, we had Luke Pierce, who was 17 and 18. That's that's a pure economics decision. Even, even if you look at capability, the economics of that decision speaks for itself. Um, so yeah, that's, that's, um, the, I think now, nowadays, if you can get on, if you're ambitious and you've got the work ethic and the support behind you, you can go very high, very quick. Um, but there's also a place in refereeing. There's all the other rugby that still needs to happen and still needs re referees to, to be out there refereeing below that. Um, it, it's crucial that we, we still have numbers that do that. Yeah, absolutely. Now, also something you mentioned there was the, right at the start was the review process and the assessors and all that kind of stuff. <laughs> Just sort of describe that for people. How kind of rigorous is it? You know, what kind of things do you go through? Uh, how often is it every single game or are you getting assessed just in certain games? Just give me a sort of overview of everything if you can. Yeah, I think it, it differs depending on what pathway you're on. So, so that's that season that I talked about when I was just getting onto the panel, I was assessed eight times formally. So that's one, one every three matches really during the course of a season. Um, and that was where you'd have an independent assessor would come to the game and they would assess you. And it really isn't. It's an assessment of what happened on that day and how you performed on it. Um, you'd then have a, I'd have a coach as well. So that day I was with you in, uh, in 2002, my coach was there as well. And he would watch, he would watch me for perhaps four or five times over the course of a season, if not more. So you kind of get that coaching development as well as the assessment development. Um, so, so back in those days, you'd have those reports. You'd, they'd watch the game. You'd obviously referee the game, play the game. Uh, the assessor would watch the same thing, and you'd get a, a, a hot debrief afterwards, where you'd get get three things that went well, three things that stood out, and perhaps needed to be considered. Um, and then you'd get a report two or three days later, which which mapped that out. And hopefully, the conversation and the bit of paper were the same. Um, sometimes, um, and I remember one um, experience in in the East Midlands where I'd gone, whereas the the assessor. Um, was was quite critical and he phoned me on the Sunday night and said I've just looked at my notes and I've thought about it again and actually I think I was a bit harsh on you yesterday uh, so the report you're going to get is going to be slightly different to what you'd expected and that was a really good conversation it's the, when it's the other way around that you've got a problem um, <laughs> where you, the, the, the debrief afterwards has been okay and then you get a stinker later on but look, that's life isn't it people see things and write things they're there to, to kind of help and contribute to to your game and that was back back then now um, where there's video analysis, there's videos taken of most levels of rugby. The quality may not be good, but it's it always great to leave a rugby club with a DVD. Jeepers, that's, that's going back in time. Where I've still got a collection of them somewhere. I've got no, no way of playing them. Um, but you could then watch again. You could look at some of those incidents, um, incident, yeah, incidents as they go through and, and think, well, what could I have done? What really happened? What happened? What did I miss? Because, um, of course, you've only got one pair of eyes from the spot you happen to be at any one point. Um, a, a camera on the stand or two cameras when you get into TV land 12 cameras can show you all sorts of things that you've got no hope of seeing um, and that's the challenge so how you then take all that information forward um, all those reports would then go into the development the referee development team they would analysis and you kind of get, get this ranking as you go through um, and as you as, as you go up the pyramid of course there are selectors who make decisions about who goes to the next step and then who gets what matches and all those sorts of things and you've just got to um, kind of go through the process and, and and learn as much as you can. I always took that as a, as a conversation. They were there to help. There's stuff you'd take from every report. Um, there's some stuff you might go, nah, don't agree with that and, and file it over there. But good piece of input. Might come back to it later. If you, if, you, if you ignore it and then it's on the next report and the third report again, then you might revisit and say, oh, that's three reports now I've said the same thing. I must, I'm the only common denominator between those three reports. So maybe it's something I do need to have a think about. Um, but that's part of, of, of how we all develop over time. Yeah. Now, the most interesting bit of that that I think um, people possibly don't understand as well as they might is the positioning part. The view of a certain instant from a certain angle where the referee is might look very different to where I don't know, the crowd are or a TV camera is. So yeah. what are your thoughts around that and how best as a referee to kind of not mitigate, but just do the best you can with the information you have? Yeah, I mean, it's all about experience and learning. The interesting, the, re the report from that day in, in October 20, 2002 said that because I, I anticipated play being better than it was, so I was my running lines were going to where I thought play was going, not where it was. So I was, I was, I was about fourth or fifth to the 
to the incident by the time I'd corrected myself and got there. But that's just about reading. Uh, reading again, the more experience you get, depending on how you, you, your fitness levels clearly impact all those sorts of things. Um, and you just get into a position that works for you um, and, and enables you to do it. And you, by doing it more often and thinking about it, um, you get into the, the positions that you know are the right ones or the, the ones that will allow you to make the right decisions. Um, and that, of course, that changes through a game, in a game, through a season, um, depending on where you are, what's going on, the pitches, the quality. Like, I mean, I, I'm, I'm quite lucky that my club down here where I do a lot of my refereeing now with my, with my teenagers is, um, is 4G. I mean, it's an all-weather all pitch. It's a very different experience to running around on the, that old back pitch at um, old Colfs in the mud in, in January. It's, it's just a different platform. So therefore, you, you are able to perform and run on it differently. Um, and that's um, part of understanding. Of course, I'm now 20 years on from knowing the game and being involved in the game. So I've got the stuff I know is going to happen before it happens. And that allows me, me to cheat slightly because I've got the experience to cheat um, and still get the right decision. Whereas as you're working your way through up and you're kind of learning the game and learning what you go and, and learning how things change as you go up the system, as you, as you go up the pyramid, that's that's always the bit that is harder to, 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 to execute because everything changes. You get used to level four and then you step up to level three, you end up in the championship and it's like quicker, faster, stronger. Um, and the game lasts that little bit longer. So you've got to be fitter than ever before to, to, to keep going and to adjust and um, and do all the physical stuff while the mental process is still working like Billio to make those accurate decisions and process what you're seeing to um, to make the right decisions or make the right non-decisions, which is a very specific rugby term that uh, we can go into if you want to. Yes, I do want to go into that, Keith. Talk about that because it's a really important piece of refereeing. Um, the the things you look at and go, right, I'm not going to call that, even though by the letter of the law, it's potentially an offence. Why would you make those non-decisions? So, um, for one, we, we use this word materiality all the time. And that's a, if, if a referee doesn't come on and mention materiality in some way, shape or form, then there's something not quite right in the world. Um, that's our, if you like, get out of jail card for everything. So the, the, the laws of the game, so our, you've got one to 21 laws in, in the law book, um, 100 and whatever pages we're, we're at in terms of law. Um, you do not want me, no one listening to this wants me to go out and referee that law book in every game. Um, so I have to make decisions all the time as to what each scenario I'm refereeing needs, what it looks like, what the, deci- what the decisions could be or couldn't be at any point and to make uh, and to make decisions accordingly as a really good example actually links to something we're going to talk about later on um, let, let's take a line out um, you as a, as the defending as the defending seam in a line out you think I'm not going to throw anyone up into the air for this I'm going to wait for them to hit the ground and then I'm going to sack it I'm going to maul it I'm going to try and disrupt that ball on the ground so hooker throws the ball in and it's not straight it still goes to the, the guy that's in the air, the, your, your opponent who's been lifted in a pod, but he's taken it up there rather than there. I, that is against the laws of the game. The ball needs to be thrown straight. But you're the defence. You've chosen not to compete for that ball. So I've now got a decision to make as a referee. The law book tells me that ball hasn't been thrown straight, but my my eyes are telling me that no one's been impacted by that throw not being straight. So I've now got that. That for me is a non-decision. Um, I've made the decision I don't have to blow my whistle. I don't have to have a scrum because nobody's been impacted by the offence that the hooker's just made in not throwing it. That's materiality. Um, and the art of refereeing is is making those decisions at every situation, no matter what it is, all the time when you've got two different sides trying to do different things and trying to un- understand what the game needs at that particular moment in time. Now, it could be that the reason you're not competing for that line out is because the throws have never been straight, so I'm not going to waste my energy. In which case, that's material because your decision has been made because I haven't refereed it and they've got away with it. Um, but if you're if you're never going to compete for it, then does, I don't need to blow my whistle. We don't have to have a scrum, which we don't need to then reset six times um, and all that kind of stuff. I don't need to stop the game. The game's in flow. Let's get on with it. Everyone wants to play. No, Nobody, apart from your particular fan club friends in the front row, want to have too many more scrums. Don't I have 43 scrums in the game? Even I don't want to have 43 scrums, <laughs> don't believe me. Um, <laughs> now, just on a more sort of general point, like what we, as you came through all the refereeing sort of ranks and, and moving forward, what were some of the biggest challenges you had personally? You know, what were some of the sticking points maybe that you came across and how did you get sort of beyond them? Um, 
I think there's, there's two things that kind of flow into other stuff that I've done since. One is that sort of sense of community and, and the, the lack of being on your own. Um, as I said right at the start, like I'm a people person. I love having people around me, whether it's a family, whether it's a work environment or whether it's whatever, whatever that it might be. So that that's having to then travel on your own and not have people to talk to and all that kind of stuff. And of course, technology now makes that a whole lot easier. Um, so that that was always a challenge for me. And we created little pods as we went. Whenever we were in a kind of referee group, whether it was the Southeast group um, as the sort of top of the London group within London Federation, I found some old paperwork as I was rummaging around the other day, my referees with potential group from back in uh, back in, back when I first going, whether it's the group we had when we first got onto the panel, that those sorts of groups still become really tight knit when we phone each other in the car on the way home um, for that sort of a bit of support some of the underlying was who's messed up this week um <laughs> because let's face it we are i know i said i wasn't competitive but sometimes those conversations do have a little bit of a competitive edge because we know at the end of the season only one of us is going up so sometimes but if you think you've had a reasonable game and you know that two of the people have messed up then that might make you feel it so those that, that was the sort of off field challenge uh, my my challenge all the way through on field was my fitness um i'm not an i'm not a natural athlete and I had to work really really hard at stuff and working so we did some really good training at Dulwich College when I was in uh, South East London which was great with a chap called Trevor Clewellyn who taught me how to sprint um, which is <laughs> I always I always think think Trev is the thing that still goes in my head so upright like a springbok running that there's a reason springbok literally the animal goes as fast as they do because of the position they get themselves into and I never did that I was I'll find any number of reports that say I was flat footed and slow off my feet um, and there's only so there's only so far that that can get you without you doing something about it. So identifying those things and working really hard at it with the, with the, the two real things. Um, but yeah, those are the two things that I found both one on one off field that um, always I had to work really hard at. Um, and I say I think it probably did read I did reasonably all right off the back of it. Yeah, talk, let's get to that bit then. The you know refereeing in the championship. The championship is a fantastic level of rugby. Has been for a long time. Yeah. What were some of your memories from that and maybe sort of big games or big moments that you happen to be involved in? Big, big moments are always bad ones from a refereeing perspective. So I've got I've got I've definitely got one of them. Um, I think that being being around that level of rugby is awesome. I mean, I, as I said, I was never that ambitious. I didn't I never had any expectation of getting there. Um, but when you're refereeing teams like London, Welsh, Exeter at the time, um, I was in the championship the year that um, Northampton came down from the Premiership that sort of year. I, I distinctly remember walking into Birmingham, Birmingham Bees, Birmingham Solihull as they were. I'm in mean, their old ground before they moved out of it. A real, a traditional pokey little rugby club. It was brilliant. Um, you walk into this really small, compact changing room with the wooden seats with your pegs on over the top of it. And I walk in there and see Carlos Spencer and Bruce Rahana sitting on the bench playing that. And that was just, those are the moments that kind of jump out. I mean, I think, blimey, how have I got here? Um, being in London society was great because we used to referee at the Middlesex Seven. So actually being able to say I've refereed at Twickenham um, is, is something that not many people can actually say. And that that's always great. Um, but big moments, yeah. I mean, hopefully the, that I was involved in some of those championship playoff games. I was a TMO at the time. I went in the TMO truck afterwards. Um, but big moments and, and how you get through them. And this is a story I t I'll tell people. Look, referees make mistakes all the time. Um, most of the time you get away with them. Um, and there was there was one game I did, London Welsh Exeter at Old Deer Park. Um, it was one of those tight games. It was a big year for both for both of them as they were both kind of pushing pushing their way through in the championship. Um, scrum, it was like a five-point game. There was nothing in it. Um, Exeter just about pushed off. Last play, scrum to London Welsh, about seven metres out. Um, scrum gets... Scrum goes and it collapses. Um, blow for a reset because there's nothing you can do there. And then blow the final whistle. No one reacts. Not a, not a jiffy. Everyone says, no, great game. The usual handshakes, no issues at all. And as I'm walking off the field, um, Danny Wilson, I was a coach at London Irish, come, comes up and says, as I, I can sort of hear him chuntering over your shoulder. And Danny's a great guy, so he, does, he always does it in a nice way. So said, Keith, you can't do that. You can't end a game like that. And as I'm walking, I'm going... Oh no, because you can't end the game on a clap scrum. You just can't do it, and I just did. Um, and the five point game. And to be fair, to be fair to Danny, so I got I, as soon as I got into the changing room, I phoned Steve Lation and said, "Steve, we got a problem. I'm te I want you to hear it from me first. So I, I, he was the referee manager at the time, um, and still is now. He's back back doing that role. So I phoned Steve. Look, we've got a problem. I've just messed up. 
Um, I'll go and speak to the London Welsh guys in a minute. I just need them to calm down, but you need to hear it from me. Um, um, spoke to my AR, who said, yeah, you're going to have to do something. So I went in and spoke to, the, the, to Danny again, the captain and the chairman at the time, who was... He was a traditional Welshman, and he his face was still beetroot red in anger. Um, I just I just say, look, you got to hold your hands up in those moments and say, look, sorry, yes, we've we make mistakes. That was mine. Um, and then the kind of I started a blog at that point. So then I wrote about apologising and all that kind of stuff off the back of it. But I think in how you deal with those adverse decisions and how you deal with problems and 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 the the downsides um, in the grand scheme of things, look. There was no impact. It didn't really have a chance. I mean, Welsh could have scored off the, off that if I'd have reset that score. There was no there was no big issue in the grand scheme of things, but it wasn't it wasn't a pleasant experience um, in, in that club. But it's great. I've, I've been back there since, and we I've seen Danny a lots of times since then as well, and we sort of still have a, have a moment about it. But I think for me, just I how I dealt with it was was the thing that I was most pleased with, and how we then kind of worked for it because I think. You can either bury your head in the sand or you can accept stuff and, and try and move on from it. And that's accept and move on is a phrase that I've used a lot from a personal perspective. So I can't do anything about it. We've got to make sure it's right going forward. I've never never made the same mistake again. <laughs> yeah, I'm not surprised. Yeah, that's um that is a big one. But yeah, well done. Because you know, I, I've definitely remember times being refereed when I thought, well, that's definitely an error. And I can say it to the referee, you know, in a polite way, as I typically did. And I can see them go, oh, God, he's right. But just kind of brush it off. Like, yeah. I think in those situations, it's much better to say something along the lines of you could be right. I'll look at it next time or something, something like that, where you're sort of saying, OK, yeah, I see what you're saying. We, we've got to find a way of listening to players without listening to players all the time. Um, and that's the balance in it from a refereeing perspective. If you open that door, then you just get bombarded for 80 minutes by everybody. I think developing the relationships on field um with with the captain or if you weren't a captain i'd have found you anyway because i knew you're a decent guy and if i had a problem in the front row you could solve it for me or at least we could have a conversation um and those sorts of things um some of the things that you think will be an error won't be it'll be that's an opinion um but there are some things in in rugby that are black and white and that for me that is a clear-cut error there was no there's no gray area about it we can debate whether you stepped out whether they hinged first whether who who pulled who what that's a matter of debate and who what you think happened versus what i saw happen that's all conjecture when we get into those black and white stuff you, you can't hide behind something that's black and white um, and rugby's not very black and white and that's why we totally love it um, that's why I, that's why i get involved in what i do i um, trying to solve some of those those quandaries um, um we love it because we have those contestable areas that means that we've got a difference of opinion um but sometimes we get the the gray the, the gray areas where the fun happens yeah, I completely agree with that, Keith, 100%. Now then, let's talk about these rugby laws in general. Like, from the start of the game, you know, because people are talking about how much the laws are changing now, and, and they are, but the laws have been uh, evolving forever, basically. So what's your take on that and why the laws change and, and for what reason, all that kind of stuff? Yeah, I mean, rugby's around for a long time now. Um, and obviously, but way back in the in the day, some the, the great and the good sat down in there. Um, I, I'm guessing in the gentlemen's club and, and with a big bit of paper and had to map out the laws that they wanted to, to, to for the game to play by. And, and rugby has evolved since that point. Um, and it's still evolving, sometimes quickly. And that's that's a, that can be a good thing, um, sometimes very slowly. And that can also be a good thing because we still want to retain the sport that we play. All those great things that we love about rugby, we want to keep it, it looking and feeling like that sport. Um, so we have to be be mindful as we go forward how how changes happen and 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 what do that. I it's, look, I'm in, a, I'm in a really privileged position now of of being involved in that process um, from working for World Rugby and being involved in in that law law making process, law changing process, the clarifications process, and all those sorts of things. And we have some great conversations about that, um, and we have to strike a balance between change for change sake. Um, change because there's a player welfare issue that needs addressing. Um, and then developing the game as an entertainment spectacle, whilst recognising that 90% of the people listening to this podcast don't get a penny for what they do, um, probably even higher than that. Um, in the game, it's like the top 1% get some money out of it. Everyone else plays it for the love of the game. So we have to make sure that the game looks and feels the same and as best we can across all our population. Um, and that's a real challenge because we watch stuff on TV and we want it to look like X, Y, and Z, but then we need to want to go out and play it the following day um, 
with it where, where we don't have all those cameras we don't have that spectacle issue we still have the the game as a spectacle for your version of what spectacle looks like versus the tv spectacle that might be slightly different and the laws have to either be different and we have to be comfortable with that or they need to be re- be a be able to be applied at all levels and that's a real challenge and we have we have to have that open conversation with people in the game say what do you want um what do you want do do you want different games do you want the same game um do you want it to be applied in different ways if you apply law in different ways at different levels you'll get perhaps different outcomes and you have different conversations around it and i'm so i'm really fortunate to be involved in those conversations all the time now um in kind of figuring out how we want the game to develop going forward and by having all those opinions and stakeholders, we're not going to get it right all the time. Yeah, that's right. You can't please everybody. That is for sure. I mean, from my point of view, I do want the laws to be the same because yeah. I think if we separate the top level from the amateur game, then it'll, the divide is only ever going to get bigger. and We might end up with some kind of non-contact version uh, of rugby in the amateur game. And I just think there's too much good in the game for that to happen. Uh, so anyway, that's my opinion. But so let's we, about... we need to come back to we need to come back to that um, because yeah. there is a space for non-contact. Um, and one of the things I've been really proud proud to work with them since I've been at World Rugby is developing that. And we can come back to that at a different point. I think there's a, there's a place for non-contact, but we have to get ama- amateur and, and elite rugby contact to be whatever we want it to to, to be in, in those different different spaces. Because there's, there's the game needs to look and feel the same. We we're, we're, there are there have always been subtle differences between the elite and and the community game, and everyone's fine with that. We just got to be as we go forward. We just need to have that in mind. Um, and and that's again one of the things that I think I bring to the the role I currently have is that whatever I do, um, I do or whatever I coordinate and 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 bring to the law book, I have to go out and referee it the following day when I'm doing haven't under 16s, under 13s, under 14s this season, which is what I do, or I'm doing Portsmouth Fets or haven't threes or whatever it is that looks like. I have to be able to referee that on my own on the pitches the following day, as well as the guys that we're all going to, guys and girls, we're now we're going to see over the weekend um, refereeing on TV. So we've, we've got to find that balance. And sometimes we, we may allow different areas to go in different directions, but whilst retaining the, the core elements of what rugby looks like. Mm, yeah. Okay. Excellent. Um, now then, one of the things that people say very, very often is that rugby's laws are overcomplicated. They're too hard for people to understand, especially people who are new to the sport. But the rugby law book was greatly simplified a few years ago. When exactly was that and, and what was the aim of that project? So there was a process that the, the this is before my time. So I'm, I'm just going to I'm going to tell you the fact, the factual version of it rather than what I what kind of what, what was sitting behind it. So between 2017 and 2018, there was, a, there was a group of people that got together to to really to go through a simplification project. And what, what in doing that, they kind of stripped the law book words down by about 50 percent. Um, they improved the the reading score, the average reading, the ability to read that level that went up significantly. Um, but the. So that was the principle behind it. So it created the, the, the principle of that project 27 to 18 was not to change law at all, but to cr- just create a law book that was slightly easy to read, slightly easy to implement. Um, in doing so, that has created some other issues that a knock on effect with now having to start unpick slightly some 20, um, 10 years later, or whatever it is, eight years later on. Um, and, and that's just part of the game. When, whenever I have a conversation with people that the law is too complex, my first question back is, so what do you want me to take out of the game? What laws do you want me to remove from the law book? And I will do that right now. I literally could get on the website now, take those law out of the game. The moment it comes out of the law book, it becomes legal. And that's a really weird thing to say. So if I want to say, um, uh, we don't want to have mores anymore because they're boring, we just remove them. That's easy, easy to referee. But what what is that thing now? And if that's not, if it, if all the laws connected to the mall no longer exist because there is no more law, then what what happens? We, if we want to retain, as I mentioned before, we've got all these contestable areas in rugby that no other sport does. We have Team A and Team B who both can do things at that thing, all those areas. If we don't want any of those contestable areas, we need to either get rid of them or figure out what we do. So Rugby League did that, or with the Rugby League, they don't have lineouts, so they just have a play the ball from the start. What 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 does our what does rugby union's version of that look like? 
What do the people want us to do? And I actually don't think they would do on that. I don't think anyone wants us to get rid of a particular area of the game. No one's ever come back to me and said, well, actually, let's get, let's get rid of scrums. That's just not, that's, that's not a real conversation in rugby land. Um, how do we make things slightly easier? How do we make it perhaps easier to understand? How do we make it easier to read? And how do we make it easier to implement? That's a different conversation. And what actually makes it easier is where you put more things back in. Because you can then say, at a scrum, you cannot, this player cannot do that thing. So that's actually, we, most people say, we want to stop the nine from doing that. So if we want to look at, let's, let's talk about protecting the nine. So if we want to keep the ball in play more, we need, to, we need to make sure that the nine, when the ball is lifted, like when is the ball out? Is that, that's the conversation. When's the ball out conversation? You must have heard a thousand times from nines. Referees always love it. We always say the same things. We'll decide each time. That's the answer. But if we, if we want to make that really crystal clear, I have to put something into law to make it really clear when it's out and when it's not out. Now, that's not that's simplifying it, but it's not necessarily decreasing the number of words in the book. And that's a balance. We've got to, we've got to find a way of writing things that says what we want it to say, whilst not being too vague to create holes for people to find. So a really, a really good example of, of what happened in 2017 and 18, and is now we're having is now, we're now fixing that problem. So since 1876, there was a the, the first laws that we talked about back there. It's in the it's in the Twickenham Museum. There is a copy of it. Uh, one of the laws that they wrote there on the parchment paper in the fountain pen was that a an opponent can be put on side in open play when the ball carrier runs five meters, five yards, it said at the time, or passes the ball. Those clauses have been in law since 1871. Um, now we are removing them because in 2018, there was a clause that came out because it, they didn't feel it was an important phrase um, about loitering. So when I refereed you in 2020, 2002, you couldn't loiter upfield and benefit by being there. During simplification, it said you couldn't be offside in front of a kick, but it didn't say you couldn't loiter. It just so what we what we how we the game developed, and this is again a, a conversation about unintended consequences of things, um, is that we we ended up with this scenario where in fulfilling the law as it now stood in 2018 and since then, I can stand if I'm in front of the kick, I can stand still because the catcher is going to run five meters and that puts me on side. So that's the same law that's been there since 1871. Now now isn't because we've just we've just taken it out. Um, and I think it comes back to that loitering issue that was removed during simplification, which people then five years later suddenly read it in a different way and thought, well, actually, it doesn't say I can't stand still. So I'm just going to stand still, which is why we ended up in that scenario last year of the Bath Gloucester game with what was it, 16 different kicks and everyone stood in the middle not doing anything. Um, and it became a bit of an issue that needed to be resolved. And that's how we, we kind of put loitering back in and remove those, remove those clauses to free up that space in the game. Um, so that's that's kind of God, that's a that's a long way of talking about sort of history development of law and um, and developing what we need to now in that process of of working through simplification um, and simplification to, um, to to some people doesn't mean things to others. I, I've got a note on my board that says um, brevity is great, clarity is better, um, which I think is a good phrase. One of the uh, a chap in the US said that to me once, so I wrote it down, um, and that's a really good point. We we might not want to be Taking things out makes it shorter. Putting it in a better way might be might be better for us when we come to law development. But that's a long term process. Um, we don't want to change stuff too much too often for the sake of it, um, because people get upset by that. Um, and fundamentally, the game's in a great place. Let's not forget. So, I, I, I watched the, the 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 top fourteen final on Friday night. Uh, what a what a brilliant game of rugby that was. Um, a, a great to lose were all over all over that against um, Bordeaux but it was such a good game of rugby and we've seen some fantastic games of rugby over the last 12 18 months um, so the game itself and, and the laws that go with it are fundamentally in a good place so we don't want to do too much um, unless there's good reason to do that yeah I completely agree uh, but that was a really good sort of description and explanation of um, the development of law and as you said really importantly the unintended consequences which is why there is quite often law trials. Now, talk me through the law trials uh, with specifically the new ones that are coming in 
um, at the moment in the under 20s World Cup because there's one, and I'm thinking of the 20 minute red card, which I think is really polarizing opinion. Yeah. So the, the, the way the law process works from a world rugby perspective, we have these big shape of the game stakeholders meetings. We had one in February where stakeholders from all over the world um, of all levels got together to decide what do we want the shape of the game to look like. Um, and off the back of that, there were um, a number of different things we were asked to look at. Um, some things to change straight away and some things we need to just have a think about and see what actually happens, what the consequences are, what the unintended consequences are and that kind of thing. So it's easier just to pick off the ones that are, are just full time. So we've changed the law as of the 1st of July. Um, those issues that we talked about being in front of the kicker, that is a law change for everyone for new competition starting from now. Um, the You can't have a, a, a scrum from a free kick. That's now a law change. Um, and the crocodile role, real player safety issue where players are getting in there and being wrenched left or right, um, players often diving in off their feet to, to that croc role, really bad injuries when they happen, So they, but that's been removed from the game. So they are law changes. Um, if, if we want to change them again in the future, that needs to go through a different process, but those are happening all over the world for new competitions from the 1st of July. We've got to have a way of some ideas that are discussed in a room on a podcast, and I'd love your 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 ideas and your and listeners' ideas as to what they want to change, what they might want to change, introduce, take out, all that kind of stuff. We've got to have a way of taking those brilliant ideas that happen from all quarters and figuring out what they look like. Um, so we put them into clo what we call closed trials, small competitions that have a start and an end that might be a different age group. It might be a competition in a particular country or a union might say, we'll do this. Um, we've got a competition, South Africa, have got something called the Varsity Cup, where they have a university program scheme quite short they do some law trials also all those sorts of things we as world rugby own the under 20 championship and the under 20 trophy we own wxv they are our competitions so we can trial things at our competitions um the summer internationals they're not world rugby's six nations that's not world rugby's it's six different competition owners own their own competitions around the world different leagues so we don't have any control over those so what we've said in the 20s this year so it's a only a three week three week competition for the under 20s um the championship in south africa trophy in scotland is to say look we've got these ideas that people discussed that shape of the game for different reasons um let's put some of them into to, to the championships and see what happens um so we're looking at things like um so from an output perspective what can it be refereed so from my perspective my, my with my refereeing hat on it's not my day job but my my hobby can can these things be refereed and what and is it easy to do can the players do it? Um, is it easy to do? Um, can the coaches coach it? Um, and and what are the concept? What are the coaches thinking about trying to get round it? Trying to take advantage of it in a relatively short window. So in the under twenties, we've got um, some. You mentioned the twenty minute red card replacement, and that's a crucial word in that conversation. It's a replacement. It's not a long. It's not a long yellow card. The player that gets sent from the field does not come back. So what? Come, so we've got twenty minute red card replacement. Um, we've got the line out not straight that I talked about before. So that's being trialed. Uh, we've got the mall can only stop once and then it has to come out rather than two. So on, on that one, we're rewarding the defense. If you can stop a mall, that's the the ball needs to come out. It's the only time in the game where in normal law, you've got two goes before you have to, you have to defend it twice before the ball has to come out. So that we're going to see what that difference that makes. Um, we've got someone wanted to trial the kickoff from a, a mark from a kickoff or restart at the moment you can't we're going to see what happens with that uh, and then we've got a reduction in kicking time so 60 seconds for a conversion as well as a penalty and then 30 seconds for a scrum and a line out so diff different things we can trial to see what happens we've obviously got lots of game metrics we've got video we've got stakeholders there to see what happens um, when those laws uh, happen on the field um, and then we've got to go through an evaluation process to see um, how it whether it works, and some of them will never be, see the light of day again. Some of them will go, well, that was easy, and um, it had a positive impact, so we can perhaps move them in, into law at some point in the future, or it needs more trials, we need a, comp a different competition, a different age grade, um, or whatever it may be. We kind of have that decision-making pow power or conversation to have to say, what do we do with it next? But we need the data, uh, we need the experience to, to kind of guide that idea. It's all very well having an idea in a room of... of whatever that room looks like and the great people that are in it. But until we get it out on the field, what, what actually happens? Um, so yeah those, yeah, those are the things that are happening in the twenties, the 20 minute car, the 20 minute red card replacement is one that's been debated around the world. 
um, at different levels. Obviously, it's it's been in, in play for the Southern Hemisphere, some su- Southern Hemisphere competitions for a while now. Um, we've never had an opportunity to to have that in play with Northern Hemisphere teams involved. So this is of the, the the Northern Hemisphere teams are involved in the twenties. Um, so it's an opportunity for them to have that experience to see whether that um, helps helps them make decisions going forward because world rugby is a sort of governing body we we are governed by our council which is made up of representatives of people from all over the world from the union's perspective the regions um and, and different people so it's not my decision to make it's the as a governing body it's the it's world rugby's decision to make um and that needs to have a have balanced opinions and balanced arguments in play and obviously having real experience from teams all over the world we'll, we'll see how that plays out yeah, yeah. The the twenty minute red one is interesting because there are a lot of people very against it. I personally oh. think it sounds like a good idea. I think it, it penalises the player, not the team. And as long as the disciplinary process afterwards then reflects, you know, the incident that happened, then I think it's probably might be a very nice balance between what we're seeing at the moment, which is a lot of red cards for somewhat technical offences. Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, I mean, that's the conversation. Or... <laughs> yeah, I mean. I, 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 I'm sort of ambivalent. I've seen it on both team, on both sides. The concerns that people have that we've not been able to answer so far have been, has been around kind of a free reign to go out and nail your opponent to take them out of the game. That that always comes up in conversation. Now, in, in elite rugby, that just doesn't happen because it's all on TV. The disciplinary process that if that was to if that was to happen on TV, the consequence for that player would be enormous. So that doesn't happen because they'll lose their they'll get banned for six ten matches contracts will be at stake and all that kind of thing in the community game that's not a that's not a factor from a player behavior perspective so actually the 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 trial to watch is what happens what happening in new zealand so new zealand rugby are trialing the 20 minute red card replacement at community level for this season um, so, and, and unions can try what they like effectively around the world as they see fit so that's the one i'm watching uh, I'm not hearing any great upset from anyone in New Zealand as it's happening on the ground. Um, I I think if people are saying that, we don't have a very good opinion of what rugby is about. Um, we have those core values in our game that we are all built around. Um, and I would like to sit here and say, I just don't think rugby people are like that. Um, there are millions of people that play rugby all over the world. So you might have one or two that have that in their mind when they go out that day. But is that... Is that a reason not to do something for the sake of one or two people who shouldn't be involved? We don't we, we don't want those people in our game anyway, um, although we'd like to rehabilitate them and show them, bring perhaps teach them the values of the game through and, and then perhaps make take that in, into off field stuff. Um, but that's just that's just something we need to try. We need to see what happens and we need to ju- the, the game needs to make a decision as to how we move forward. But there are there are 100 percent really strong and valid views on both sides of this debate. And at some point, we're going to have to collectively come up with um, a, a way forward that either says yes, no, or or keep the hybrid in the middle. Yeah. OK, cool. Now, you mentioned it earlier, the, the blog uh, and the website. What is rugbyreferee.net? Why did you start it and, and what's it become? Yeah, it's a great, it's a great question. So actually, uh, rugbyreferee.net was preceded by a personal blog that I'd started before that. So people might 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 remember me from my days as ref blog, um, which was just a way of um, kind of getting home after a game and kind of bat- batting some thoughts down as to how the games had gone and all that kind of stuff. No one ever read it. Let's be fair. It had a really small readership, but it was fine. It was it was quite cathartic. Um, I did my I think the, the where I'd written about that incident at London Welsh Exeter was probably the uh, um, the the piece that got the most traction because it got picked up somewhere and was on was it Rolling Moor was that I don't know if that still exists the, the that that forum so it got picked up there and it was just, it was it was, it was good um, but as part of that and I was sitting at home as a reasonable as a reasonable level referee in England in the English system and I was I was getting really frustrated in not being able to find stuff for me. Um, you'd hear about these meetings, these IRB meetings as they were there, where something would happen. You might hear about a law change from someone on a website somewhere, but you couldn't find stuff. Um, There was no place to go. I wasn't getting sent stuff from the RFU about it. I was finding stuff out from different sources. So I was on an email list from somewhere. So I, I was finding stuff out. So I was getting more and more annoyed about not being able to find stuff. 
Uh, and my wife said to me, just do it yourself. Stop whinging. I, I, can't, I can't do anything about it. Do it yourself. So I literally that night, I, I, I bought a domain name. I thought, well, I've got ref blog. That's relatively straightforward. I've taught myself little bits and pieces about WordPress to, to make it look half decent. Um, so I started the website and it was it kind of grew from there. That was 2012. Um, it's just me. I just, it's still a sort of side hustle. I, it's become the sort of go-to place for that stuff that I could never find. So I do weekly appointments that I get from sources all over the world. They send me stuff during the week. I format and it goes out on a Thursday evening. So who's refereeing what at the weekend? So um, people are kind of, that's got an audience of its own. And as we've gone, I've gone through, I mentioned like the community issue there. I'd always had it in the back of my mind that refereeing can be quite isolating. Um, I only, when I'm, when I'm refereeing in county, when I was at society level, um, I'd, we'd have our monthly referee meetings and then I might speak to my guys um, in my little group um, or I might bump into a, a another referee at a club who was coming home or going back. Um, particularly those outside of London. London was great because we'd all, we were all within a spitting distance of a particular club. There were places you'd either go back to Beckenham in the southeast, you'd go to um, Richmond, of course, the two rugby clubs there and, and that kind of stuff. So there, was, there were places where referees would hang out and that doesn't happen everywhere else. I thought, let's, let's Facebook still a thing. So we create the Facebook group to go with it. Um, I only let referees in there. There's some qualifying questions. So occasionally a coach tries to get and say, look, can I, I just want to learn more. I, I'm really strict on that. It's not that we, there aren't places for coaches to go, knock yourself out and go, and go and do coach stuff. But I wanted to create this community space for it was only referees that we could talk about refereeing stuff in a kind of safe space where I'm not getting picked on um, because I, the coach for that team, or I, I feel I can't speak because the coach it might be here and we might get into an argument, that kind of stuff. It doesn't very rarely happen. It might not, but I really restricted it. So we've got the website. Um, we've got the the Facebook group now. It's got over 4,000 members in from all over the world. It's kind of grown. It's, it's brilliant. It's a brilliant community. I look at the, the stats every now and again, and the engagement rate that we get is something like 96% of group members see, at least see the posts um, and the way the Facebook algorithm works is that that's really good. Um, even if they don't engage, if they don't post, they don't have to comment, they don't have to like, but they're being shown it and they're being shown it because there's posts all the time. There's there's comments about stuff. There's questions that people have. We've got international level folk who kind of lurk in there. We've got brand new starters. We've got age. People sometimes apologize when they come in, say, I I'm not a referee, but I only do age grade. No, we need you. You are the you are the most important people in my community, in that community group. Um, so that's really developed its own little world. We've, I, I, I say I've got a podcast. You have a proper podcast. I've got a, a thing that I do every when I get round to it. Uh, I've done about 40 episodes over time. Uh, so the Advantage well, Jones podcast, people... I kind of do that. It's, it's, it's great. And I, I kind of, I, I know I've beaten that seven podcast episode thing. So they keep coming every now and again, but I kind of now, I have to be a bit careful in how I how I do that kind of kind of things, and there's only so many hours in the day. So yeah, that that whole community stuff has grown. The website's grown really nicely. I have some really good conversations. It means I get to, to talk on podcasts like yours, um, which is great uh, because we are a fundamentally we are a fundamental part of the rugby community. We sometimes get missed off, um, and that's either by design or default or whatever it might be. So having that ability to kind of learn from each other, to figure out, get tips and advice from things like that has, has been really great. And I love seeing those conversations of uh, new referees saying, this happened to me today. Did I make the right decision? What could I have done better? And getting some really good support or I've got my first game on Saturday as a league game. Is there anything I need to know about? Is the process different? What do I need to think about pre-match paperwork, all those sorts of things that you don't think about when you rock up to your first level four match in 2002. Uh, we've now got communities where we can talk about those things and we can have you go in armed uh, and aware of what's about to happen. Um, and that's really great. And the feedback we get from that, um, obviously the numbers, they keep coming back and they keep commenting about it. So that shows that the value of the community is, is really great there. Um, and it, it's just, it's a really good place and it's really positive. And apart from maybe, maybe international weekends, I sometimes have to put um, post um, approval on first before, because rug rugby, rugby refs are still fans of the game and they still have strong opinions about what happens on the stuff that they're watching. Um, and sometimes they forget which hat they're wearing when they go in and, uh, and make comments in there. So I, sometimes on the international weekends, I put post approval on so I can um, perhaps educate people before it goes in. I'm really strict that we're not there to criticise fellow referees. There are enough people out there who will criticise referees for right or for wrong. 
um, we are not having that in, in our community. So it's a really positive environment. That's so interesting to hear that that kind of stuff does happen even within a refereeing does. community as well. We're humans. But- yeah, absolutely. Um, now, with with that, I my stance on sort of criticism is that it's absolutely fine to analyse the decision, the scenario and all that kind of stuff and, and then think, well, what would I have done in that situation? Was it the same? Was it different? And it doesn't actually matter. Whatever you decide, just park it and move on. That's that's yeah. my sort of opinion on it. And never would it ever come to saying that referee was terrible or that referee just, you know, shouldn't be involved or, or anything like that. Do you think that's a reasonable approach? Yeah, I thought it goes back to core values, doesn't it? We, we've all got our values of the game, the, the integrity, the respect, the discipline that we all we all have, and we we, we have as our core values that um, embodies itself in, in rugby. And I think as long as we're, we're maintaining that, um, and, and I guess it's a recognition. I, I think what lots of the the commentary, the, the the problems that the game has is that people don't fully understand all the stuff that we get involved in. That's part of our fault as referees that we don't talk about it enough. Um, we've just talked about a tackle, uh, uh, all those contestable areas, and people are only seeing what they what they see, and therefore they. I just would love people to just be a little bit more open. And say, well, just because I've seen this doesn't mean the ref what the referee's seen is wrong. It's just different. Um, and without giving the, I've got to be careful how I say this so I direct people without leading the witness. Go and watch a video on YouTube. It's a New Zealand road safety video. It's an exercise I always get people to do, and I'll put it, I'll share it with you, you with the link. It's called something. I'm not going to say what it's called because that gives you a clue as to what I want, what what the the point of the video is. Um, but it really does show that if you're looking at one thing, you can completely miss other stuff that's going on. Like at a break, at a scrum, for example, there we have 16 players um, at least, well, 16 players in front of you, plus everyone else around the side. The ball can be in one place. The scrum halves can be blocking that view. You've got all eight participants potentially doing on each side, potentially doing something okay, not okay. I can only stand in one place and look at a couple of those things. In theory, maybe just one of those things. So just because I'm looking at that thing, even if the other thing that's happening is right next to it, I'm looking at that thing, so I'm not going to see what's happening right next to it. Um, and if people just kind of understood that, um, understood that a little bit more, they might just have that different lens. So if you're listening to it at the weekend, think, have a look at where the referee is. And cameras are great because you there's so many cameras. Before you go and criticise them, just have a look at what you think they might have seen or what they might have been looking given the context of that situation at any, any one point. And that might give you a, might lead you to a different conclusion. Or for me, the best result there is that you say, yeah, I've seen this and I'm right. They've seen this and they've seen something different. They're also right. We, we're in a game that that's okay. We are completely comfortable with the fact that you and I are going to watch the same thing, have different opinions on that thing, and we will both be right. That's rugby. And we've got to keep that, I think, to, to, on the whole. And that, that creates these brilliant conversations that we have all the time. Yeah, 100%. Uh, Keith, that's a brilliant way to finish this part of the show. Let's move on to the stash section. So what is your favourite bit of stash that you've ever received? Well, I've got a couple. And I needed props this. So I'm glad we're doing this on videos. This is terrible for, pop, for, the, for you podcast listeners, but I will describe it. Um, so I never reached the dizzy heights of, it, of proper international rugby, but I did get sent by the RFU to do Italy versus France under 18 um, in a place called Piacenza in northern Italy. And um, that was my token international status. Um, so we were given as from an RFU, you only get the white RFU shirt um, if you uh, if you're an international referee. So I got my white shirt. It's got a rose on it, which I, I'm a Welshman also. So I, I have a slight conflict, um, but I've kept that one. So from a kit perspective, that's one of my more more proud ones. It means something. But afterwards, I got I, this package arrived in the post. I thought this is a bit odd. They said they were going to send me something, and I got given this seat cover. Um, so this is just a a, a a seat cover that I was given on the day. It's inscribed with the the date of the match, a um, uh, sort of bum protector, if you will. Um, Italy versus France under 18, so 9th of February 28. And I was given, I was sent that in the post with a, po- a big A3 poster of pictures of the game, the sort of the anthem lineups um, with me in the middle of it, uh, which is re- just really nice memento. So I've got a box of bits and pieces that I keep. So that's, well, it's not stash, but it is a, it's a, it's a nice memento that I uh, um, I did achieve something in the game. And that kind of, it's nice to be recognised and that it was, it, was a, it was a pleasant surprise to receive that in the post. 
That's amazing. I mean, that's definitely a captain's stash. Definitely. But there's loads of things, isn't there? When you when you kind of get involved in rugby, I mean, as a refereeing perspective, ref shirts aren't particularly great, but you kind of get different things. I, I've got one, um, and this goes back to community. So there's a guy that I that sends me stuff from, sends me stuff, sends me appointments from New Zealand all the time. Chris Chris Johnson, he's a brilliant guy, solid. If you ever need any data about referees, he is the man to go to all over the world. Um, but he sent me this shirt um, from his society for me to wear. It's the uh, Manawatu Referee Society, and it's just uh, a bit of a unique shirt. I, we have to be careful when we're refereeing. Depending on who's put us there, we have to wear the right kit. So if I'm if I'm there as a society, I have to wear my society kit. If I'm there in some other banner, I have to wear the appropriate kit, and that's just right and proper. But sometimes when you're doing a kids' game, it doesn't matter. You're there for the sake of it. So I I trot that out. It's a great bit of a uh, of, of, of kit, and that and that just speaks to the community stuff. So I've I've met Chris once. We happened to be in Paris last year for the World Cup. Uh, we met in a hotel. I took him a, I got him a world, a referee shirt from the World Cup because I could, um, and he he gave me that in return. So it's brilliant. So I I do have a referee shirt from from every World Cup as well, um, apart from two. So I'm missing eighty seven. So that was the very first one, and two thousand and seven. But I've managed to find, get hold of a referee shirt from every other World Cup. So that's something I've got to keep going through through time. But uh, there's just loads of little bits and pieces that um, just kind of brings us into the game nice mementos of experiences that we've had um i've got as, as many tankards and shirts and, and ties and all that kind of stuff that we all pick up through through time so i can't remember where i last wore a tie i'll have to find some way of displaying that at some point um yeah it's, it's nice it's nice to have those things well if anybody's listening and has got a 1987 rugby world cup referee shirt or well, 2007 I... getting tricky well, that that would be great to have in my collection. I think the issue back then is that there was they were only made for the the guys on the field, um, and of course they, they they would have been kept quite rightly for as a, as mementos of there. So they're, they're, they'll only be in very short supply. So. Yeah, I'm sure. Now then, next question: What is your favourite kit of all time? So this can be any team from any era or any referee shirt as well, if if that's what you well, prefer. Yeah, I, I I'm going to stick with my refereeing, stick in my lane. Um, and, and the shirt that I always think about is the one that Ed Morrison was wearing in that World Cup final in 1995. It was the, it was pretty awful. As a, as a shirt, it looked awful. And I do have a black version. It was kind of, his was grey. It had sort of off stripes. It looked pretty rubbish. But the picture that you've got of him blowing the World Cup final, A, an English referee that we all aspired to as I was coming up through the system. English referee in a World Cup final, absolutely amazing. Um, so to see him there, that obviously the context of that South African World Cup, it was the Pinar Mandela moment um, of, of of Ed blowing the whistle and then trying to get out of town as quickly as he could. Pinar's behind him. There's that iconic picture. And that's the shirt I always um, go back to from a refereeing perspective. When I think about referee shirts, that's the one that kind of jumps back to my mind as a, as a real moment in the game. Um, obviously, you've got a different level, diff, the different tiers to that to that picture. Um, because most of the stash, most of the, the referee shirts that we have are pretty dull and pretty neutral because that's the point. We're supposed to stay out of the way and unmatched. So um, there's not many great referee shirts out there. Um, but that one really yeah. sticks to mind. If I pitch, if you picture Ed Morris in that World Cup final, go, go and Google it. You, you'll be reminded of it. But it's a, it's, a, it's a good one I've got in my collection. Nice. OK. And what about awful kits? Uh, any you particularly dislike at the moment? Um, well, I think maybe it's an age thing, but um, the tight fitting shirts and on referees isn't isn't something that appeals to me. I they they, they don't suit my um, my aging physique as as perhaps they, the the guys the guys the young guys coming through who obviously have plenty of time in the gym and look good in a tight fitting shirt. Um, so those ones are all good. But look, I mean, from a refereeing shirt perspective, they're all they're all great. On the it's how you what you do with it, not what it looks like. Um, I, I always like a collar. I'm not a fan of a round neck collar. I just I don't think it looks very good, but um, bit, of, bit, bit old fashioned there. At least I, you yeah. might remember. You probably don't remember. I always used to wear my collars up. Um, so <laughs> I collar up. It was just a thing I, I I did. And then the kind of as as you go through your refereeing career, the collars get smaller and smaller, and they just that uh, doesn't allow it to happen anymore. But uh, I'd always I always look for that. So I'm not a, I'm not a huge I'm not a huge fan of the skin fit look. There aren't many referees. There aren't many of us now in referee land who can get away with it outside of those elite boys who've got all the, the time and, and money to spend in the gym looking looking good as well as refereeing brilliantly as well. 
Yeah, well, there's not much of a performance advantage, I wouldn't think, for a referee wearing a tight shirt yeah. anyway. And so. of course, we'd always say, look, we've, we've always got to wear comms kits as well, which never help. You get unsightly bulges and we've got straps and mics and earpieces as well. So that, that's my, I always say I'm wearing, it's my mic pack that's making me, this skin shirt look tight rather than anything else, even, even when I don't need to wear them anymore. <laughs> okay, amazing. As we bring this to a close, Keith, is there any sort of final thoughts, any sort of last messages that you'd like to say? I, I mean, look, Please, as I, said, I think I started off by saying, look, if you see a referee around your club, just welcome them in, involve them in, in as being a club. There is a, there is an important member of the rugby community as, as everyone else that you've uh, we, we've got there, and it's there's great stuff going on. I mean, I'm, I'm really pleased and proud of the role that I now can play in making sure that our game is what we want it to be. Uh, and again, I, I sort of inf we inferred it earlier as we were talking. If you've got any ideas about what you want the game to look like, if you've got any law ideas, if you've got um, and and the, the wackier the better because at least they can they might that might stimulate a conversation um if you've got stuff you think should come out of the law book then by all means let let me know um i, I can be found in most places so rugbyreferee.net is the website to go to um i am generally keith lewis rugby on places like linkedin um or or on twitter x um is the place to, to kind of find me through there but if you put keith lewis rugby into google i'm not, I'm not a difficult person to find um so yeah by all means uh, hunt me down send me a message connect always happy to talk um anyone's got any ideas or suggestions then then feel free to to, to let me know what they are and it'd be good to chat amazing uh people listening at home everything we've mentioned today will be linked in the show notes which you can find in one place at amateur rugby podcast.com so it just leaves me to say keith thanks so much for your time today and really super valuable insult insights absolute pleasure okay there he goes. Thanks again to Keith. And again, from my point of view, this is all just about sort of broadening the understanding. And we've got some great insight there about what can happen when you change the laws, the unintended consequences, the thought about what the referee's looking at might not be what exactly what you're looking at. And you both can be correct. So have a think about that. And of course, if you have ideas, which I know you do, everybody does, then do get in, in contact with Keith and let him know. Now then, currently over on YouTube, we've got a summer series going on. I'm doing a load of content on there, match reviews of all the games over the weekend. We've got an epic weekend coming up this weekend. So get over to YouTube, subscribe there on the Amateur Rugby Podcast, and it is free. Don't need to pay anything. I know people are worried if you subscribe, it might cost something. But on YouTube, it's free. Um, and if you've enjoyed this podcast, you can do all the social media stuff, you know, all the likes, comments, shares, all that kind of stuff. But what I'd really like is if you mention it to someone in person the next time you're down your local rugby club. But until then, get out and play. <laughs>